Pastor Neil has chosen a scripture reading taken from the book of Daniel, chapter 7. Daniel, chapter 7, verses 9 to 10. Oh, sorry, 9 and 10, and then 21 and 20, 22. Verse 9, Daniel 7, verse 9. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him, and thousand, a thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. In verse 21 and 22, I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints, and prevailing against them, until the Ancient of Days came, and a judgment was made in favour of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. And God add his blessing to this portion of Scripture this morning. I don't know about any of you or your fathers, I've met Greg's father before he passed on, I met Shannon's father, I knew Mark's father, and I kind of knew my father too, and I'm, you know, when you talk about fathers, it's sad to say, mine was not much to speak of. I'm not going to dishonour him by saying too much. I did love him, but as a father figure, uh, it was pretty much non-existent, sad to say. Um, when I was 18, when I was young, 16, 17, more, more widely, and I used to walk the streets at night. Now this is at a time when young fellas walking the street wasn't like it is today. We weren't gangs and we didn't do nefarious deeds at night. But I walked the streets at night with a couple of friends, and I was, I called myself an atheist. Probably I just didn't know who God was. And um, one of these nights I was out there and I was, would often look at the heavens, you know, we're looking at times when man was about to walk on the moon, so it shows you how old I am. And um, often looked to the heavens and I'd wonder what it was all about, what life was all about. Actually, at that age, what my life was all about. Because at that age, you think you know it all, and you have a thousand questions racing through your brain, right? And you know, all the questions that people ask themselves, especially when they're teenagers, you know, youngsters, you know, about my looks, how I look, let me tell you, when you reach my age, you stop worrying about your looks, because they're gone, they're gone. You know, but when you're young, you, your age, your looks, your size, especially if you're a bloke, you want to have muscles, you know, you want to, you know, there's tall guys and there's short guys, and of course, uh, if you're a bloke, you're thinking about girls, so obviously gender comes to mind as well. But one of the questions that often jumps into your mind when you're that age is, why are humans so different from animals? This is the clincher, isn't it? Why are we so different from animals? Why am I alive? What is life all about? And I asked myself one night, who was behind all this? Because it became very, very clear to me that even though I never heard about God, I never knew about God, there was something, something behind all of this. I knew humanity wasn't taking care of things. I mean, back then humanity was making a mess of things. I know it's even worse now. And evidence has taught me that perfection doesn't exist within mankind. So there had to be something bigger than man. And I guess I knew instinctively that there must have been a supreme being. I guess deep down I realised that there was a God behind it all. So you can imagine what it was like, 15, 16, 17. You're so sure of yourself and you have no fears of life itself and yet you look up at that sky at night and you know that in contrast to all the stars, all the universe that you can see, swirling up around there, swirling around and around, I realised 
just how insignificant an individual I was, how small, how puny, how tiny I was compared to all that. And I think that was when I finally twigged that there must be a God out there. Must be a God out there. And it was really a case, I guess, from that point forward, was to establish a communication link with him. So today, I'd like to talk about God, who I think he is, and what he means to me. Now, I'm going to jump to one side. Just want to pull one moment. I know time's against me. One of my first introductions to God, I was about 10. Um, I had school sores. Do you know what school sores are? Yes. Yeah, you get them on your legs. I don't know where else you get them. I had them on my legs. And they put sulfur compacts on them, and... Um, you kind of have to isolate from other kids. And uh, there was a new Sunday school starting up in our district. It was being developed, the, the district, and the Sunday school teacher was actually going to sit on the front lawn of our neighbour's home before the hall, the community hall, was built. And she opened up, she was talking about God, I guess, Moses, Jesus, I don't know who she was talking about. But she had, she was talking about God for sure, but she had some encyclopedias. You know, back in those days they were in black and white. You may not know this, kid. You may not know that there were books with black and white pictures in them. It's true. They really existed. Anyway, she had these encyclopedias and she opened up to a page, whatever she was talking about, she opened up this page, and there was children that were amputees. And instead of arms and legs, back in those days, they didn't have prosthesis, hands or feet, they had hooks, you know, as appendages. Pretty common, not unusual. And I said, sitting on the fence, legs standing on the fence there, saying, what happened to these children? What would any kid say when he sees pictures of children with, with that hooks for hands and peg legs for legs? And she said to me, this is my introduction to God, that's what God does to you if you don't do the right thing by him. So you can imagine, for all my teen years, I'm thinking that if there is a God, we have a tyrant out there. And you know what? I would be willing to bet there's a lot of people out there that think we have a God who's a tyrant. And we just read, Shannon just read it for us, the great day of judgment begins, fiery thrones with burning wheels move into place. The Ancient of Days takes his seat, presides over the court. His awesome presence pervades the vast courtrooms. We heard all that, we know, and we're getting this impression. We have a God who's a judge. And um, I don't know, there was a TV series called All in the Family, where the wife was constantly saying to her husband, God will get you for that. So I lived with the fact that God will get me for that if ever I do something wrong. So we have this concept of God, and it's out there. And a lot of people have said this is because the Old Testament displays this. You know, um, Pollyanna, death comes unexpectedly. A God that wants to punish if you don't do things right. Totally amazing what's out there. And this all becomes possible because of the misinterpretation of a few Old Testament verses. I'm thinking of ones where, now I've totally misstarted my start of my sermon, but this is where it comes where things are like in Deuteronomy 32:35, when he says, Vengeance is mine and recompense, their foot shall slip in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things to come hasten upon them, verses 41 and 43, if I wet my glittering sword and my hand takes hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to my enemies and repay those who hate me. Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and render vengeance to his adversaries. He will provide atonement for his land and his people. And we go, wow. Well, wow. how do we equate this God with the New Testament God of love? The New Testament God who stresses turning the other cheek, going the second mile. Now, 
You and I know that it is the same God that's in both those Old and New Testaments, but I'd like to have a look right now at the God, at God the Father as portrayed in the Old Testament. We'll see if our Heavenly Father is indeed a vengeful God. Well, according to Exodus 33, no simple human being has ever seen God. Remember Moses had to hide his face away in the cleft of the rock? We have no photograph of his features. However, God has demonstrated his character by his gracious acts and by the word picture he proclaimed before Moses. You all know this from Exodus 34 verse 6. I'll give you the references and one ask you to read them up, look them up for time. Exodus 34, 6 and 7. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy to thousands, four thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means cleaning the guilty, clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. I took that to the third and fourth generation because there's another one that says if we keep his commandments, he's faithful for a thousand generations. So we put that in context. But here we just find that we have a God who is a God of mercy. He loves mercy. <clears throat> Yet his mercy does not blindly pardon, but is guided by the principles of justice. Those who wish to reject his mercy, well, you're going to re reap his punishment on your sin. It's just the way of it. At Sinai, expressed, God expressed his desire to be Israel's friend, to be with them. He said to Moses, do you know this text well? Have them built for me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Ever since Adam and Eve and the separation, he's wanted back with his people, he wants to live with them. And because it was God's dwelling place, that sanctuary that was built by Moses, the sanctuary became the focal point for Israel's religious experience. And eager to establish lasting relations, God made solemn covenants with people such as Noah and Abraham. And these covenants reveal a personal loving God interested in his people's concerns. To Noah, he gave the assurance of regular seasons. You didn't know that, 8.22, Genesis 8.22. But you do know that he would never, ever produce another worldwide flood. That was one of his promises. To Abraham, he promised numerous descendants and a land where he and his descendants could dwell. So our God is a covenant God, a God that wishes to have an everlasting contract with his people. And I do mean everlasting. <coughs> and we also find that he is a redeemer God. As God of the Exodus, he miraculously led a nation of slaves to freedom. This great redemptive act is the backdrop for the entire Old Testament and an example of his longing to be our redeemer. God is not a distant, detached, uninterested person, but one very much involved with our affairs. The Psalms particularly were inspired by the depth of God's loving involvement. Psalm chapter 8. I shouldn't say chapter 8. Psalm 8, verses 3 to 5. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've ordained. What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you've made him a little lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honour. I'm going to read the last of it too because it's very interesting. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hand. You've put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea. This is Genesis talk. This is creation talk, and he's saying, what is man? I know, I'll put all of my creation under him. That doesn't sound like a vengeful God. It sounds like a God that has created a world for us to live in and to take care of. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth that finishes. David saw God as one that we, in whom we can find refuge. The psalm's recurrent theme of refuge pictures both Jesus and the Father. 
Psalm 27, for in the time of trouble he will hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me. He shall, he shall set me high upon a rock. And you know this one, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble, Psalm 46. Psalm 125, as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forever. And finally, as David himself experienced God's loving involvement, trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. But God is not only a God of refuge in David's eyes, he was also a God of forgiveness. And if ever a man needed forgiveness, this, this was the man. After his sins of adultery and murder, David earnestly pleaded, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. He also said, Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. He was comforted by the fact that God is wonderful, wonderfully mercy, merciful. <clears throat> I'd like to take you to, with me to Psalm 146. Again, time does not permit. Just write this down. He who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry, the Lord gives freedom to the prisoners, the Lord opens the eyes of the blind, the Lord raises those who are bowed down, the Lord loves the righteous, the Lord watches over the strangers, he relieves the fatherless and widow, but the way of the wicked he turns upside down. Isn't this a wonderful picture of just how good our God is? Notice not one thing that's from the New Testament here. This is our Old Testament God. God is a God of goodness. He's also a God of faithfulness. In spite of God's love for his people, Israel wandered away from him most of the time. Not once or twice, most of the time. In spite of God's love for his people, Israel wandered away from him. And God is depicted in the Bible as loving Israel as a husband loves a wife. The book of Hosea beautifully illustrates God's faithfulness in the face of deliberate unfaithfulness and rejection. God's continuing forgiveness reveals his character of unconditional love. Though God permitted her, the church, to experience the consequences caused by her unfaithfulness, even while she attempted to correct her unfaithfulness, he still embraced her with mercy. God reminds his people of his faithfulness when he says, O Israel, you will not be forgotten by me. I have blotted out like a thick cloud your transgressions and like a cloud your sins. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. No wonder he could say, Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. The Old Testament description of God being a God of vengeance must be seen in the context of the persecution of his people by the wicked. Although the day of the Lord thing permeates the writings of the prophets, God's actions are on behalf of his people at the end of, the, at the end of time. It is a day of salvation for his people but it will be a day of vengeance on their enemies who will be destroyed. Isaiah 35, 4. Be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. So, if God is a God of vengeance, He is a God of vengeance to His enemies and to our enemies. But His vengeance is not towards us. It is never towards us. So to set the record straight, while God is a God of vengeance towards his enemies, at the same time he's a God of salvation. And God is a Father God. Now God is a Father God. I was watching a religious program on television a while ago, I think it was called Where Jesus Walked. And the commentator made the statement that I nearly fell out of the chair. Because he said Jesus introduced the idea of God being a Father to his people. When 
It was pretty early in the life of the Israelites when Moses had actually said to them, and this is in Deuteronomy, when he said, Is he not your father who bought you? Has he not made you and established you? Moses referred to God as the father of his people. And so the God of the Old Testament, whom some see as a virtual God, is in reality the God the Father. He is a God of mercy, a covenant God, a redeemer God, a God of refuge, a God of forgiveness, a God of goodness, a God of salvation for his people, and of vengeance to the enemies of his people. He is a Father God. As we have just learned, this God of the Old Testament does not differ to the God of the New Testament. If anything, the God of the New Testament, Testament is more revealed. I don't think there's any more profound scripture as there is found in the Gospel of John. And John 1 begins with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the light was the light of man, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Jesus is God incarnate, God in the flesh. Jesus is the God-man. Verse 18 of the same chapter. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. And Jesus tells us that he come down from heaven, John 6. And John 14, he says, He who has seen me has seen the Father. And Isaiah 9, 6, Jesus is to be called mighty God and everlasting Father. I think the Hebrew, the writer of Hebrews sums up the situation well. God, who at various times and in various ways, spoken times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these days, last days, spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, or I'll repeat that last phrase again, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word, by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Wow. So Jesus revealed the Father and in so doing brought two more qualities to light. Firstly, God is a God who gives. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave. Gave his one and only Son. And secondly, from the same verse we find that our God is a God of love. And Jesus gave practical demonstrations of God's love. He stooped down and washed the feet of his betrayer, fed the hungry, healed the deaf, gave speech to the dumb, gave sight to the blind, he cured lepers, raised the dead, forgave sinners, we should say amen to that, and cast out demons. Jesus knew that revealing the precious love of his Father was the key of bringing people to repentance. And finally, finally, the New Testament makes it clear that the Father will be involved with his Son's return. In Revelation 6 it says that the wicked will cry out to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. You know, it is with a longing heart that the Father anticipates the second coming when the redeemed will finally be brought into their eternal home, then his sending of his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him will clearly not have been in vain. Only unfathomable, unselfish love explains why, though we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son. How could we spurn such love and fail to acknowledge him as our Father? Truly, our God is an awesome Father God. Amen. Amen. Dear loving Heavenly Father, we know how much you love us. And we know that at times you seem so far away. But Jesus has made it abundantly clear how close you really are. Father, we have to push from our minds 
what we've learnt when we were young, that you are a vengeful God and focus on your love, your love for us, your love so much that while we were yet sinners, Jesus died to bring us home to you. Father, draw us all closer to you. May we see your love in the world, in nature, in your word, in the eyes of the little ones that we saw this morning. Father, we know you are close to us. Please draw us closer to you still. And we thank you for when Jesus comes to bring us home to you. And we hope that will be soon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.